Hello there, my name is Owen Humphreys. I'm an artifact specialist with Museum of London Archaeology, and today I'm going to talk to you about the lives, deaths, and magical practices of the people of ancient Britain. Specifically, I'm going to talk about the more than 5,000 artifacts recovered from recent excavations in Cambridgeshire. As part of the A14 road improvement scheme between Cambridge and Huntingdon, we dug some of the largest trenches in British archaeological history. 250 archaeologists worked for two years, excavating an area the size of 800 football pitches. This landscape is a slice through the whole of British history and prehistory. Discoveries spanned 12,000 years, revealing stories of vastly different lives. In the Mesolithic period, hunter-gatherers made flint tools on the gravels of the River Great Ouse. In the Neolithic, we see pottery emerge. From the Bronze Age, we find weapons and jewellery in burials and monuments. In the Iron Age, we see farmsteads emerge with the first coins. From then on, we have the extremely material-rich settlements of the Roman period, before these communities disappear in the 5th century, to be replaced by Saxon and medieval settlements, some of which last to this day. Since then, much of the landscape has been fields and floodplains, with the remnants of these thousands of years of occupation lying untouched beneath the surface. Today, I'm going to talk about the heyday of this landscape in the Iron Age and Roman periods exploring the activities, identities, and beliefs of the people who lived here around 2,000 years ago through the thousands of portal artifacts they left behind. To kick things off, let's go back to the dawn of the Iron Age in Britain. Whilst we found monuments and burials from the Bronze Age and early prehistoric periods, the Iron Age is when this landscape's first settlements become clear. The shift from bronze to iron as the major principal material for tools and weapons was a major technological and social shift. Iron is more abundant and simpler to work than metals that go into bronze, leading to significant disruption to the economies and societies that are developed around bronze. At the A14, we have found direct evidence for this transition in the form of this unassuming iron object. This iron bar, approximately 60 centimetres long, is the earliest iron working tool from Britain and one of the earliest iron objects from the country. It's called a poker shovel. Like a modern fire poker, it's used for maintaining a fire. Unlike a modern poker, it has an expanded spatulate head rather than coming to a point. This allows it to be used both as a poker and a rake. When you're forging iron, you need a very hot fire. The fuels you use, such as charcoal, contain small amounts of water. If you put fresh fuel straight into the hottest part of the fire, the water will vaporize, expand and explode. That, that's what makes a fire crackle and pop. But in a forge, that can be very dangerous. Smith used tools like this to move fuel slowly into the centre of the forge, drying it out before it was burned and allowing them to maintain a steady heat. This type of tool was used across Europe, although we mainly find them in Britain. Most examples date to the late Iron Age or into the early Roman period. This example, however, is much older. We found it with early Iron Age pottery and burned animal bone that we radiocarbon dated to between 800 and 500 BC. This is extremely significant, as it shows that specialised ironworking tools and knowledge were present in Britain from the earliest stages in this technology's development. The tools and ways of working introduced at this stage remained unchanged for hundreds of years. It's worth stressing that iron objects from this period are exceptionally rare. Iron was a valuable material that could be easily recycled, and this is especially true for tools. You can see that this poker is bent in two places and possibly snapped in the middle. We see the sort of destruction on other Iron Age pokers. Perhaps this was a ritual act, taking a valuable tool out of the realm of the living before depositing it in the ground. In any case, this object shows that this sparsely populated part of Cambridgeshire was at the forefront of technological development in the earliest Iron Age. I'm going to be using the term Iron Age throughout this talk, but another name people use for this period is the Celtic period. We tend to avoid this in archaeology as it's a bit outdated, but one of the questions we often get is what tribe did the people of this area belong to? How useful these labels are is a matter of debate. A lot of them are backwards projections of Roman administrative boundaries into the Iron Age. But it's still useful to think about how these people interacted with their neighbors near and far. Coins provide perhaps the clearest indication of those interactions. Coinage starts appearing in Cambridgeshire before anyone was even minting them locally. We have some of these very crude abstract coins known as pottins that were made in Kent in around 100 BC. Despite how simple they are, they were widely traded. and We find them as far south as Paris. Whilst we're in France, we also have this early gold coin. 
Unlike most coins, this lacks a head size, only having a horse design on the tails. These were minted in large numbers by the Ambiani tribe in Gaul. We actually have quite a lot of them from Britain. And one theory behind why that is, is that they were used to pay mercenaries and allies who went to France to fight against the Romans in Julius Caesar's Gallic Wars. Whatever the case, these coins show that even in the early days, the A14 was tied to wider British and European economies beyond tribal boundaries. Eventually, people more locally start minting coins, and we get our first insights into the possible tribal identities of the area. The A14 landscape sits at the border between lots of different coin-using polities. People we might term the Catavalloni, Trinovantes, and Iceni. It's therefore not surprising that we find coins from all of this group at the site. At the end of the Iron Age, these coins seem to be subsumed under a single ruler, Cunabellin, in what we call the Eastern Kingdom. The people of Cambridgeshire were on the boundary between these different political and cultural groups. But instead of this resulting in their exclusion, you can see that they participated in trade and cultural integration with many different peoples. These Iron Age coins are also quite beautiful objects in their own right, and their design reflects the changing politics of the time. Note how the horse design becomes less abstract over time, moving from left to right. In our latest Iron Age coin, issued by Cunabellin, you can see that the horse is replaced by a lion, an exotic animal unknown in Britain, and a Latin inscription, showing clear Roman influence. These wide-ranging connections are also manifested in how people dressed. We don't have any furnished burials from the Iron Age, so we can't talk specifically about how people constructed their outfits. We can talk more generally about how the types of dress accessories they had compared to those found elsewhere. The most common type of dress accessories were brooches. These safety pin-like fibula brooches become very common in Southern England in the late Iron Age, representing new styles of dress. They're probably worn in pairs, one on each shoulder holding up tube-style dresses, or singly to fasten cloaks. We find them in the early Iron Age, but they're really not common, only becoming prominent later on. Like the poker, many of these brooches were deposited in pits and kilns, sometimes in small groups, potentially as religious offerings. As with coins, we see long distance imports from an early date. French fashion is nothing new in Cambridgeshire. Imported brooches are present from as early as the second century BC, such as these examples. But there's still a local character to the fashions we see. When compared to the types of brooches found at other sites, we see a lot of these simple Colchester brooches depicted here in the center. These are common on other sites in the emerging Eastern Kingdom and would have been traded here along with Eastern Kingdom coinage. There are also peculiarly British objects being worn here. One of the first pieces of jewelry you think of when you think about the Celts are large neck rings or torques. Some of the most spectacular gold examples were found relatively nearby at Snettisham in Norfolk. Like early brooches, these are restricted to the wealthy in society. But also like brooches, in the late Iron Age, we see a proliferation of base metal torques across the social spectrum. This neck ring here is made of copper alloy and is sized for a child. At the same time, we also see cosmetic grinders undergoing a similar trajectory. These are small bronze mortar and pestles that would have been used for grinding up substances. They're sometimes called woad grinders, and they were probably used for makeup. We don't know exactly what they were used for. When not in use, they could be suspended from the belt. Again, these are rare throughout most of the Iron Age, but become very common in the late Iron Age and Roman periods, suggesting that specifically British makeup styles became widespread amongst the cosmopolitan milieu of other imported dress styles. I don't want to paint an undue picture of harmony in this landscape, however. These political changes and social contacts were the result of war and destruction, as well as trade. One aspect of Iron Age practice that we read about in Roman sources is headhunting and the curation of human heads. The Roman writer Diodorus Siculus tells us that when their enemies fall, they cut off their heads and fasten them about the necks of their horses. The heads of their most distinguished enemies they embalm in cedar oil and carefully preserve in a chest, and these they exhibit to strangers. This brings me to another one of the most exceptional objects from the A14 excavations. What we have here is a fragment of a comb made from a human skull. It was originally perforated for suspension. The delicate working that needed to take place to make this object required the bone to be fresh rather than old and rediscovered. This shows that the person working the bone knew that what they were working with was a human skull. So what on earth was going on here? There is growing archaeological evidence that some forms of ritual practice involving human heads did take place in Iron Age Cambridgeshire. Skulls and skull fragments, some showing cut marks from deliberate defleshing or polishing from handling, 
showed that human remains regularly continued to circulate amongst the living. During the research for this project, my colleagues have identified a plethora of uses for human skulls, including as vessels, sometimes lined with a resinous material to make them waterproof, large pieces perforated for suspension and display, and smaller perforated pieces, which may have been used as pendants, spindle whorls, or components of rattles. The skull combs are unique to Cambridge. Two further skull fragments with comb teeth cut into the edges have previously been found at Erith and Harston Mill, both in Cambridgeshire. The A14 object has coarse teeth, but is within the size range of more normal bone and antler combs. It may have been used for personal grooming. Sources for Iron Age hairstyles in Britain are quite limited, but suggest that some could be quite elaborate, meaning that styling and trimming the hair would have been an important part of constructing identity. The use of human remains within such a context might indicate a ritual dimension to these practices. Alternatively, it may have been used in textiles work. There is some precedent for this. In spindle worlds made from human femurs in Scotland and bladed tools made from human long bones, possibly for tasks such as hide working from sites in Cambridgeshire and Bedfordshire. However, in this instance, there's no obvious wear on the A14 object, suggesting that it saw little use as a comb. It is also unclear from the published descriptions whether the other combs were functional or whether the teeth in them were simply scratched in place. And we hope to examine these to confirm this. The significance of the use of human remains will obviously depend on who the person providing them was, whether they were part of the community, such as a family member or an honored ancestor, or an outsider, such as an enemy killed in warfare or through practices such as headhunting. It's difficult to determine which was the case in this instance. But the presence of weaponry on the A14 shows that violence and armed combat were part of life in the area. From the Middle and Late Iron Age, we have fragments of iron spears and copper alloy sword hilt fittings. Whilst the spears may be for hunting or warfare, swords were elite martial weapons in the Iron Age. Combat and the threat of violence provided opportunities to challenge or maintain power structures, to acquire wealth through raiding, to display personal skill and bravery, and to acquire honour. These kinds of processes may have been woven into the fabric of life in ancient Cambridgeshire, where the appearance of weapons within an otherwise unremarkable Iron Age settlement is a reminder of our need to incorporate violence into our general accounts of the societies in the region. So for the Iron Age, we have a highly connected society on the edges of tribal groups and kingdoms, but connected to rather than excluded from all of them, and through them linked to the continent. It's not a wealthy place like the royal centres of Colchester or Stettisham. This is a rural community carrying out craft, agriculture and trade. But even so, we can see growing material wealth over time. It was a place that was open to new styles and ideas, but also firmly rooted in centuries of continuous craft and religious tradition. By the early first century AD, the Roman Empire had pushed its way right up to the channel. Julius Caesar unsuccessfully invaded in the mid 50s BC, and though the Romans didn't try again for 90 years, we can envision that the developing British powers, like the Eastern Kingdom, would have maintained diplomatic, trade, and clientship relations with the empire. We can see the elites of this period adopting Mediterranean consumption habits, like drinking wine. Some are buried in Roman style armor. But how much did that affect what was going on in the countryside? To finish this period, I'd like to zoom in on one community living near Bar Hill. Here we find a number of objects which challenge how we think about rural communities at the cusp of the Roman invasion. This is the bowl of a small spoon carved from bone. It's a typically Roman type. The small bowl is shallow and would not have been useful for liquids. When complete, it would have had a long, probably spiked handle. These may have been used for eating shellfish or snails or other things that needed to be dug out of a container though we can't be sure. What we do know is that they never really caught on in Britain. We only really find them in towns and forts, suggesting that whatever food they were designed for did not become popular. This example is strange, however, as it was found on a rural site at Bar Hill, and it dates to before the Roman conquest. At the same site, we also found this fragment from a multicolored glass bowl. Again, this is a type of Roman style dining vessel that we don't often see. And again, it dates to before the conquest. These objects suggest that someone at Bar Hill was dining in a Roman style. How about these two silver coins? These are British Iron Age coins minted by the Iceni. What is unusual about them is where they were found. We recovered these from a ditch which also contained a child's skeleton. Coins are common inclusions in Roman burials, thought to represent payment for the ferryman in the afterlife. But we very rarely find coins in pre-Roman burials, 
and only in places where other evidence for Roman contact can be seen. Also in that ditch was this pendant made from a dog's tooth. Dog remains are something that we find in children's burials in the Roman period. We have five other children's burials with perforated dog teeth from throughout the Roman world. Writing in the first century, the Roman author Pliny described wolf's teeth as useful for curing childish terrors, fighting fevers, and protecting infants during teething. And this may provide a context for the British burial finds. However, this is the only one we know of from an Iron Age context. These finds show that at Bar Hill, a small rural settlement on the northern edges of the Eastern Kingdom, people were dining in Roman style and burying loved ones according to Roman beliefs before the conquest occurred. For all that the Romans sold the conquest of Britain as one last push into the distant unknown, the people of Cambridgeshire certainly knew all about their neighbours. In AD 43, the Roman army returned to Britain and the conquest proper began. Whilst this was a seismic event for British history, we can't see the moment of conquest itself reflected at the A14. There's no dramatic destruction or evidence of fighting. If we believe the history, the Eastern Kingdom had surrendered long before the Romans reached this far north. In fact, you'd be hard pressed to point to any immediate changes in the first decades of Roman occupation at most of our sites. We obviously have new coinage coming in with Roman emperors' faces on them, but the use of coinage doesn't change. The Iron Age was defined by small amounts of mostly low value copper alloy coinage, and so is the early Roman assemblage. The only place we see any Roman silver coinage is at Bar Hill, the same site that produced the silver Iron Age coins. Economically, then, there is little change, and the hierarchy of settlements appears undisturbed. In dress, we also see little change. Most people continue wearing what we call Colchester derivative brooches. These are essentially the same as the Iron Age predecessors, only varying in terms of uh, minor aspects of construction. There is, however, one site where things are a bit different. To the northwest of Bar Hill is another Iron Age rural settlement at Fenstanton Gravels. Whilst things continue as normal elsewhere, here we see a big reorganization in the early Roman period, with new layouts and probable masonry buildings. We also see new additions to the dress repertoire. These brooches are very similar to the ones I've shown you already, tibular style safety pin type brooches used to hold up clothes and cloaks. However, these have a distinctive form with flat molded strip like bows, decorative knobs and a hinged pin rather than a spring. We call these Hod Hill brooches after an early Roman military site where lots of them were found. And in fact, large numbers of them come from Roman military sites. Some archaeologists have speculated that these may have been part of conquest period military uniforms, the brooches used by Roman soldiers to keep their cloaks on. We can't be certain about this, and they are certainly found in non-military context. Whilst not strong enough to suggest that the site had a military function, the presence of these objects at Fenstanton Gravels nevertheless suggests that this community had connections to the incoming military and its networks, a connection quite distinct from the Gallo-Belgic continental connections demonstrated elsewhere. The Roman army does eventually turn up in the A14. From about a century after the conquest, we start to find fragments of military equipment, fittings from armour, belt mounts, buckles, harness fittings, and even some possible weapons. The proportions of equipment vary. On some sites, they account for only 1% of the finds, but at Fenstanton Gravels, they make up 8.5%. That's a higher proportion of military equipment than we found recently when excavating an 18th century barracks. Looking at other sites nearby, we find military equipment on most major rural settlements in the area, extending right through the Roman period. Even when campaigning had moved far to the north, the Roman army clearly had a presence in this area. This could have been expressed in many ways through the recruitment of local men, the settlement of veterans, the movement of troops around the country, or the stationing of troops locally as an element of official control. So really, our story for the early Roman period is one of continuity rather than change for most people. They carried on living their lives and going about their daily activities with perhaps little more than a change of management. Eastern Kingdom coins replaced with Roman coins, Iron Age warriors replaced with Roman soldiers. But some settlements like Fensant and Gravels went through more profound changes with new connections and likely new people. Perhaps these settlements had more of a connection to the new towns and forts that were emerging, whilst the rest of the countryside remained untouched. But nothing lasts forever. Fundamental change eventually came to the A14 in the late Roman period. The late third century onwards is a period of strife and internal instability for the Roman Empire. The imperial throne changed hands constantly, the currency tanked multiple times, there were wars, raids and several attempts to break Britain away from the empire. Many towns and cities seemed to shrink, 
strangely, this disruption contributes to the countryside becoming more deeply enmeshed within Roman economies and lifestyles. This graph here shows the number of coins from the A14 in different periods. Early Roman coin usage was very low. This is consistent with national trends. At the height of the Roman Empire, coin use was largely limited to towns and forts. But from the late third century, successive crises see the introduction of new types of heavily debased, low value coinage. This small change finally makes its way to the countryside in large numbers. These coins make up most of the A14 assemblage. This suggests that people on the A14 in the late Roman period were routinely paying for goods and taxes with coins for the first time. Most of the coins circulating in this period were crude copies. These are not forgeries per se, but appear to have been semi-tolerated by officials who were unable to maintain an adequate supply themselves. The coin on the left is an original, the one on the right is a copy. Note how the face has become distorted and the eye simplified. On the reverse, we have an image of a spearman attacking a fallen horseman, and on the copy this has become extremely garbled and abstract. This is actually one of the better copies. Some shrink to only half a centimetre in size and are completely unrecognisable. Dramatic changes can be seen in this period at the River Great Ouse site. People have been living here since the Bronze Age with small settlements. In the Middle and Late Roman periods, these are replaced by a large villa compound. With this change in site function comes new lifestyles and new consumption patterns. The disposal of object rockets with hundreds of finds from late Roman deposits versus only dozens from earlier. This is a far cry from the early Iron Age or even the early Roman periods when objects appear to enter the ground mainly as rare offerings. Now iron objects, including large things like this gridiron, could be deposited complete in ditches and fields. The dress styles established in the Iron Age are also abandoned in this period, with the safety pin-like fibula brooches being abandoned for more decorative plate brooches. These may have been worn more like badges. The one on the right is in the form of a chicken and may be a reference to mercury. If so, this is the only evidence we have of the Roman pantheon being known at this site. We also see new hairstyles, with hairpins in particular becoming popular at the River Grey Ouse, showing the adoption of empire-wide styles. However, these changes were not universal. We found very few hairpins outside of the River Great Ouse Villa, suggesting that smaller com communities did not adopt these changes. It would be wrong to see dress in this period as entirely Mediterranean and Roman in style, however. A fascinating late Roman burial of a woman wearing her jewellery gives us clues as to what local style consisted of. These objects include fashionable late Roman glass and jet beads, which could have been sourced in Britain, as well as multiple rings and bracelets. Because this woman was buried wearing her jewellery, we can see that she had a bracelet on each arm and one hand had all of the rings on it. This is a style of wearing jewellery that we can see on other sites in Britain, whereas elsewhere in the empire, people wear the same types of objects differently. The late Roman period also sees the development of new industries in this rural setting. This is particularly evident at Alconbury, a settlement which may also have existed on the periphery of an undiscovered villa. We found 300 pieces of bone and antler waste from the production of luxury inlays and veneers at this site. These were used to decorate wooden boxes and furniture in the 4th and 5th centuries. Inlays are not uncommon in Roman Britain, but they're typically found on urban and military sites. The craftspeople working on this site will have been highly specialised, with specialised tools, selling their products to distant customers. Also at Alconbury, we have this unusual copper alloy plate. This is the terminal of a tool called a temple, used to stretch fabric on a horizontal loom, a modern example of which is shown here. Horizontal looms were not previously thought to have been used in Roman Britain, but research carried out for this project suggests that they were widespread in Eastern England at the end of the Roman period. This shows that the people at Alconbury were connected to the continent and continued to learn and adapt as the empire and its technologies changed. The late Roman A14 landscape was therefore a place of apparent prosperity despite the relative chaos of the wider Roman world. New Romanized elites emerged, disrupting the settlement pattern with the growth of settlements of previously unprecedented size. New technologies and industries flourished, allowing for much greater consumption and waste of objects. Perhaps this was also a period when cultural and status differences between settlements became more apparent. This late Roman growth came to an abrupt end in the early 5th century. The settlements, some continuously abandoned for nearly a thousand years, were abandoned. As this graph shows, there's a sharp drop-off in the number of artifacts we find after the end of the 4th century. 
Historical sources tell us in AD 409, the young Emperor Honorius wrote to the British elites to tell them that no further help would be coming. It's fitting, therefore, that the latest dated Roman artifact we found is a coin of Honorius. This silver silica was minted between 397 and 402 AD. The presence of a rare silver coin shows that even at the very end, wealth was flowing through this site. The heavy wear suggests it was used into the 5th century at least. But after this, no new coins came to the site for hundreds of years. I'm going to leave you with one last Roman find. This jet pendant depicts the Gorgon Medusa. Pendants like this circulated across the northwest provinces, concentrated in eastern Britain, the Rhineland and north of Gaul. They are almost always found in urban cemeteries, more specifically as part of richly furnished female burials of the 3rd to 4th centuries. Jet was something of a magical material in the Roman period. If you rub it, you can generate a small static charge, giving people shocks and making their hair move towards it. This, combined with the Gorgon's staring face, would have led these artifacts apotropaic power to protect the wearer and ward off the evil eye. Whilst these were commonly used in burial rituals, perhaps providing protection in death, they are unlikely to have been made for this purpose. Several examples exhibit evidence for wear or reworking, hinting at long and complex lives. Evidence from York and London have heavy wear, suggesting that they were rubbed by their wearers to activate their electrostatic potential. Differing degrees of wear might reflect how long they were in use before they were deposited, or how heavily used they were. The A14 example is perhaps the most extensively worn example yet identified, and shows signs of having its suspension perforation replaced several times. This suggests a longer period of circulation than was normal for this class of object. The rural find spot would also be unusual for a pendant of this type if it was deposited during the Roman period. Our interpretation is that this was not deposited in the Roman period. This was found in a heavily disturbed area of post-medieval quarrying, but alongside part of an antler disc amulet of Anglo-Saxon date. It seems likely that this pendant continued to circulate after the end of Roman rule, perhaps for several centuries. Perhaps the amulet was a treasured heirloom belonging to a family who relocated from a romano british urban centre to this part of rural Cambridgeshire as a result of the transformation of society at the end of the Roman period. It might even have been brought to the area by an immigrant from the Rhineland or an adjacent area of the continent at a later date. In either case, this object represents a material bridge in the form of a beautifully carved pendant between the Roman and post-Roman societies. So that's our journey through a thousand years of history in Cambridgeshire, along the A14 from Cambridge to Huntingdon. From the earliest ironworking tools in the country, to emerging kingdoms, esoteric rituals, Iron Age people adopting Roman customs, Roman soldiers and villas, and the eventual abandonment of this entire landscape. That's just a sample of the more than 5,000 small finds that we recovered during these excavations. I hope that from these few objects, you've got a sense of how these excavations have given us new glimpses at dress, display, violence, and belief in ancient Britain. If you want to get in touch or find out more about what we're doing, you can use the links on this slide. I'm one of dozens of specialists working on this site, and you can find more talks from wherever you found this one.